So we're going to get started right now as more folks come on in. So as I was mentioning before, uh, we've kind of been alternating in person and via Zoom. We're really lucky to have Donnie Wilcox here today, the sustainability manager at Wilcox Farms, to talk about his work on the farm and the certifications that the farm has chosen to participate in um, with a focus on certified humane. Um, and I know that we got to hear a little bit about that from Elizabeth Whitlow when she was discussing regenerative organics. So hopefully this will um, sort of add in some of the content area gaps around different certifications. And then we're also gonna get to hear um, Donnie's perspective on kind of the business motiv motivation and specifically a farm business motivation for participating in um, certification programs that end up giving you a label at the end. Um, and of course, we'll have 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it along for Donnie and let's give Donnie a round of applause for coming to join us today on campus. Hi, am I think I'm loud enough? Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for, for having me today. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, like she said, I'm, I'm with Wilcox Farms. Uh, I have a few different hats. One of them is sustainability manager. I also buy all the feed for our chickens and, and do a couple other things. Um, and so today we're gonna talk about, first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about Wilcox Farms, uh, if you're not familiar with us, and kind of where we are, where we come from, and what we do. Uh, and then we'll dive right into certifications and claims. Uh, we make a lot of them, and we use a lot of certifications, and I'll kind of go through all the different ones we make, why we make them, and kind of what they do. So to start with, uh, Wilcox Farms, we're a 113-year-old family farm. Uh, I'm part of what we call the fifth generation uh, on the farm. So the farm was founded in 1909 by my great-great-grandfather Judson and Elizabeth. They're the ones in the corner there. Uh, the family story is he had a, a house and a hat shop on Queen Anne, and he went down to, uh, went down to the farm to check it out and, and fell in love with it, and he convinced the farmer to, to trade him his hat, and, his hat shop and his house for the farm, and then he went home and, and had to sell his wife on the idea um, and, and succeeded. Um, and since then, uh, it's, it's expanded over the years. Now we have about 1,500 acres down in Roy, Washington, uh, right along the banks of the Nisqually River. Uh, we also have a couple other farms up north in Burlington and Hamilton, and then one down in Oregon near Wilsonville. Um, Wilcox eggs are found in pretty much every grocery store in the Northwest. Um, and we sell eggs in kind of every shape, form, and size that you can imagine. Uh, we, have a, we have a plant that puts them into packages like cartons. We have one that breaks eggs to turn them into liquid eggs for food service. And we have another one that hard boils eggs and puts them into kind of those single serve packages. Um, overall, we have over, diff over 20 different types of eggs. And that is usually defined by the combination of claims we choose to make. And we'll go into a lot of those, but all the claims can be mixed and matched. And a big part of what our business is is managing making sure every egg is pr correctly labeled and goes through the right process for the type of egg it is. Because we'll have one house that's organic, we'll have another one that has omega-3 added to their diet, we have one that's non-GMO verified, all these different things, and, and we have to keep them all sorted to make sure we're giving the customers what we claim. Uh, also, we supply all the eggs to the University of Washington, so if you eat eggs here, thank you. Uh, Chef Tracy's been a really good supporter of ours for a long time. Uh, also, I went to UW, so go dogs. Um, this was my geology classroom. And so uh, as you can see on these products, uh, pretty much all of them, the one thing you don't see is I don't think you see the word eggs almost anywhere, except for over there. Um, people generally know what an egg is when they look at it. So every other word you see on there besides Wilcox is pretty much a claim. Uh, and, and then all the different logos you see, those are all certifications. And so that's a, a big part of what we do. All of our SKUs are kind of categorized by what claims do we make. And so I'm going to go through most of the ones we use kind of in, in a few different buckets. Uh, I've got it broken down into three main ones. Um, so the first one, those are regulatory claims. So those are claims that have some kind of law and legal force into them and legal definition. Uh, the second bucket is product value claims. So these are claims and certifications we use to 
increase the value of that particular product. And then the third one, uh, these are company value claims. So this is something about Wilcox Farms as a company that we certify or claim, uh, and not necessarily specific about the carton of eggs you're looking at. So the, the regulatory claims, uh, these are, like I said, these are standards that have specific legal definitions. The first one is cage-free. Uh, so several states, California being the big one, uh, has a law that says all eggs sold in that state must come from birds that are in, that are in cage-free housing systems. Uh, Washington and Oregon both have a very similar law. It goes into effect at the end of the year. And the way these laws work is California and others have a standard of this is kind of how much space each hen needs to have. Here are the rules around uh, how much room they ha have to have to move around, things like that. Um, and that standard has to be certified by somebody. There's a few different people who can do it. We use Certified Humane, um, and so they you know, are, work with the state of California to make sure that their audit procedure gets them up to those state-level requirements. Um, in a lot of cases, Certified Humane is actually the one who wrote the law for those states. Um, there's, there's a few other certifiers who can do it. American Humane would be another one. Um, and in a lot of ways, Certified Humane and Cage Free is kind of the baseline for all other standards. Uh, you know, Regenerative Organic being an easy one, they use Certified Humane as one of their baselines. Uh, the other one is organic. Uh, organic is, is unique in that it's actually uh, defined in federal law. Uh, the National Organic Rule uh, defines the practices and restrictions on what can be claimed as organic. Um, that's a very, it's been a very long process. It took about 30 years to get the law um, published, or the rule published. Um, but now it's, it's very firmly set. Uh, there's a lot of different certifiers who will certify you as organic. Um, Washington State Department of Agriculture will do it. We use Oregon Tilth. They're one of the larger certifiers, and there's a lot more beyond that. Um, and I think probably most people know what organic is, so I'm not going to go into kind of what that claim is. But uh, no matter who certifies you, you don't claim, like Oregon Tilth is not a claim, it's organic, and your USDA organic is usually the logo you'll see. Uh, the other thing about it is it's a, it's a federal rule that gets updated fairly regularly. We have a couple new ones this year around origin of livestock and such. Um, and as that rule gets updated, you have to stay in compliance with it as it changes. Um, there's no kind of grandfathering into that rule. Then the, the next section is product value claims. Uh, in this, we actually have claims that we certify and then ones that we don't. Um, and I'll kind of go into those. But to start with, uh, the big one for us is around animal welfare. Um, like I said, cage-free is kind of the baseline. Um, you know, I don't have any birds in cages, so that's definitely my baseline. Um, but it's kind of the baseline of certifiers. And then uh, the next steps after that, those are optional certifications. So uh, the, the main ones are free-range and pasture-raised. They, they have a few different differences from cage-free, but the primary difference is around outdoor access. Uh, cage-free hens don't have to have access to the outdoors. Uh, free range, depending on who certifies you, is somewhere between 2 and 11 square feet of outdoor access per hen. And then pasture raised is 108 square feet per hen. Um, and all of our eggs will have some kind of claim around uh, what level of animal welfare those eggs have. Um, almost everything we have is free range or pasture raised or better. Um, and so we use Certified Humane for all of those. In some cases, we have customers who request a different certification. So like American Humane, we have a couple customers who request that, so we make sure we meet their standards. Um, some retailers even have their own set of standards, Whole Foods being the big one. Um, and so we have houses and flocks that uh, are set up to meet Whole Foods' specific standards, and there's usually fairly minor differences between all of those. Uh, the other one we use is uh, non-GMO, um, so that means that for, for hens, it's primarily around the feed you give the chickens, um, and you have to be able to validate that the, the chicken feed is using, uh, it can't be grown using genetically modified seeds. Um, it's a little bit of a niche claim because as part of organic requires that uh, feed has to be non-GMO, um, so anything that's organic is already verified as non-GMO, but we do have some customers and, and products where uh, we, we need to make the non-GMO claim without making an organic claim. 
there's a very large cost difference between the two is usually where that niche gets created. Uh, and when we do that, we use non-GMO project verified. They're kind of the only game in town for, for certifying that particular one. Um, for most products, you can test for it. Uh, so you can you know, run a, a test on the, the seed or the product to see if it contains those genetic markers. Uh, there are some products where you can't, and in that case, you just, it's kind of like organic. You have to have traceability and kind of a, a system plan to make sure that you're properly isolating and tracking those ingredients. There are also a couple claims that we make that we don't have a certification for. Uh, the first one is mobile pasture raised. Uh, this is something that we do that not many other people do. Um, we're probably one of the larger, maybe the largest company that's doing this at scale. Um, and what that is is uh, pasture-raised eggs. They're, like I said, 108 square feet per hen in a, in a fixed house, so they have a lot of acreage around them. Um, what we developed a couple years ago is in order to make sure we're practicing good um, land management, we want to be able to rotationally graze, kind of like cows, and make sure that we're uh, managing the manure load, the nitrogen load, things like that on our pasture. Uh, and that's really difficult to do when the chickens all radiate out from the same house. And so we've developed a program, and I'll have some pictures at the end, of chicken houses that actually move around the field. Uh, and we think this is materially different and materially better than um, pasture raised on its own. Uh, unfortunately, no one has developed, none of the third party certifiers have developed a standard for what this is yet. Uh, and so we make the claim on our own and have our own uh, like data and procedures to validate what that difference is. Uh, I'm constantly lobbying Certified Humane and American Humane to try and get them to, to make a standard. Uh, the one place that does have a standard is Whole Foods. Uh, so if you're in a Whole Foods store and you see, I think they call it outdoor living, uh, that, that is a standard that includes mobile hen houses. Um, the other one we make is, uh, is omega-3. Uh, and this one, the main reason we don't use a certifier is you don't really need to. It's a nutritional claim. Um, and so our claim is specifically 225 milligrams of omega-3. Uh, omega-3, it's, um, shoot, I don't really know exactly what it is, but it's, it's, it's a, a nutritional element that's good for heart health primarily. Uh, and you increase the amount of omega-3 in eggs by primarily by feeding the chickens flax. Uh, and so since that's something that's testable, and we, just, we test every flock before we make that claim on their eggs, uh, you don't really need a certifier um, when we, you just have a third-party lab do the testing for you. The, the third section uh, is, is company values claims. So these are claims that are not necessarily about one individual product, but they're about Wilcox Farms as a whole. Uh, and they're things that we think make Wilcox as a company more valuable, um, even if it's not specific to an item. Uh, the first one, you guys probably know a lot about it now, is regenerative agriculture. Uh, this is, it, it's not specific to the product, it's specific to the land. So. Um, what you're really saying is we're farming on this land and we need to make sure that it's getting better. Um, which obviously when you live on the land for 100 years uh, and you're never gonna leave, uh, it's really important that you take good care of the land. Um, it's a very new certification. We used to say sustainable a lot and you know that really what that means is it doesn't get worse because you can sustain where you're at uh, and to take it to a next level you need to show how you're doing better. This has become especially relevant with kind of the policy that's being done around like climate resilient agriculture and, and reducing carbon emissions. Um, and so using, uh, we use uh, Savory Institute's Ecological Outcome Verified. And so they do things like monitoring soil carbon, biodiversity, um, water flow, mineral flow, things like that. And that's how we use a third party to make sure that we're making our land better as we farm on it. Uh, regenerative organic is another one that I'm going to get done, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, it's just a paperwork issue that I haven't gotten it done yet. We, sh we should be able to meet it. Um, and so yeah, that's, that's a new one for us. That's our newest certification. Uh, and I think you're going to see a lot more places using a regenerative agriculture certification in the near future. Um, and then the other one is salmon safe. So like I said, our farm is along the Nisqually River. We have a lot of uh, salmon spawning right along our farm. And so it's really important to us to make sure that we are doing all the right things to take care of that. Uh, 
the the certifier and us, main, the main way we work it work with it is through the Nisqually Indian tribe. Uh, they're just downriver of us, um, and they've been around a lot longer than we have, and they know what they're doing. Uh, and so we, we work with them as much as we can and just kind of defer to them. Uh, we actually ended up donating quite a bit of our wetland area to the Nisqually Valley Land Trust. Uh, just, you know, we want to take care of it, but we're not experts in salmon, so uh, we'll, we'll leave that to the experts. I think in the future, if we start adding more certifications, this is the area where you'll see a lot, of, a lot more things starting to come up. Um, you know, regenerative, regenerative agriculture is one of the new ones. In a similar vein, I think you'll start seeing claims around carbon and carbon emissions. Um, it, we shouldn't focus entirely on carbon when we talk about climate change, but that's, I think, the easiest one to understand, and that's where a lot of policy decisions are being made around. Um, I think it's likely in the future that we will want to look at some kind of certification around our climate impact, and you'll see it from other companies as well. Uh, something I spend a lot of time working on is figuring out, you know, what are the things I can do to reduce our carbon emissions? I'd love to be able to make some kind of claim. Uh, you know, an example would be with monitoring my soil carbon, uh, if I can prove, you know, I put this many tons of carbon into the soil by farming in a, re in a regenerative way, I could apply those against the emissions that I generate by raising chickens. And then potentially I could make some kind of claim like these eggs takes 50% less emissions to, to bring these eggs to you or something. Um, but that's a very specific claim that I wouldn't want to make unless I had some kind of third party telling me that, yes, you're okay to make that. Um, and right now, there's not a lot of certifications that are doing that right now. There's a few new ones, but none that have really gained a lot of traction. And I think in Washington State especially, since there's so much policy around carbon markets, you'll see one of those in the next few years. Uh, another one's renewable energy. It's kind of in the same vein, but uh, with the amount of money being put into electrification and things like that, uh, I think it's likely you'll start seeing claims around, uh, you know, using powered or you know, built using re renewable energy or things like that. It's actually pretty easy in Washington because like 60% of our power is hydropower anyway. Um, but I think I'm surprised there aren't more certifications and claims around that yet. Uh, another one, social justice. This is, a, Regenerative Organic has a pillar, so they're kind of in that game a little bit. I think next week you guys have Fair Trade, which is very much in that uh, area, although they're much more of a, an international organization. Um, I think there's a lot of development there, and I think um, you'll see more certifications popping up. We hear a lot about like living wage or um, you know, other, other things like that. In Washington, uh, farm workers' rights is a is really big one, especially out on the eastern side of the state. Um, and I think you'll probably see more certifications pop up around that. Most of the ones right now are very, like, fair trade, are very international focused, and I think there'll be U.S. ones soon. Um, so uh, I've got some good pictures here. Um, we make a lot of claims. Um, that's kind of what we do is, uh, I, you know, I don't have birds in cages. I'm never going to be the, the cheapest eggs that you find. Um, the only way I stay in business is by showing that my eggs are better in some way or another. Um, and, and I do that through claims and then through certifiers so that you believe my claims. Um, even though I do it a little bit, you should generally be skeptical of claims that don't have a certifier um, because I can tell you there's, there's products out there that make claims that I know are total bullshit. Um, and so uh, you definitely want to kind of do your research when you see a claim, uh, especially if it doesn't have some kind of certifier attached to it. Um, there's, there's three main buckets of claims that you see out there. That's probably going to hold true for most products, even outside of eggs. Uh, you've got claims that, that are regulatory that the government will enforce. Um, you've got ones where they want you to make, the, where they want to establish value of a product, and there's ones just about companies in general. Um, and the last thing I got to put it in there, uh, there really is a difference between uh, eggs that come from birds in cages in Nebraska and uh, eggs that come from this. Um, I think it's worth it, and uh, I appreciate you guys. Uh, these are these are pictures of our. This is our mobile hen house here, and this is the tractor we used to pull it. Um, it's got solar power on it. The hens just kind of, they just kind of go wild. Um, and we got some, some dogs over here. They're mainly to protect them from predators. So we got a lot of eagles and coyotes and stuff. And we've got, I think we have like 22 dogs on our farm now. Um, 
and just trying to keep them safe. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of bald eagles, which means you can't use like any, you know, you've got to make sure you take care of them too. Um, and the last one, you know, we, we just, uh, we don't, we're kind of making it up as we go with mobile pasture. So we try a lot of breeds of chickens and you'll see a lot more variety than you would in other eggs. So I know I, I went a little fast, but um, thank you for your time. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and I should let you know that one of the required resources for this week was, I think, a video of the dogs. And that, all brought, that was my uh, sort of my bias towards showing them that content. So hopefully folks got to watch that great. I think it was just a couple minutes of like the origin story of how the dogs came to the farm. Um, uh, what kind of dogs are they? Most of the ones we have are Great Pyrenees. Um, they're a little bit too big for what we use, so I think we've been, we've been trying out a few breeds right now. Our neighbors know the Great Pyrenees really well because they like to range. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so we, um, we're really lucky. We have a good amount of time for question and answers. Um, so feel free to, if you do want to get up and walk around, you're welcome to walk up to the podium and ask your question, or you can ask your question from your seat, and then for the sake of folks who are listening to the recording, I will repeat it out loud again into the podium mic. Okay, so the question is about the egg shortage. What's going on? Yeah, I figured someone would ask. <laughs> so uh, there, right now there's a really bad outbreak of avian flu. Um, I think around 50 million chickens have been culled in the U.S. Um, the main reason why it's like that uh, is the avian flu. Is, it's one of those diseases where they're really worried about it potentially jumping to humans. Um, and so anytime you have any detections, they depopulate like the entire comp the entire farm, basically. Um, it's, it's fairly terrifying. Uh, we haven't had it, thank God. Um, we've got some partners out in Montana who've had it. Uh, and it's it's not fun. Um, it's really really horrible. Uh, but yeah, it's you know when you lose 50 million chickens in a year, um, it causes eggs to be pretty short. <laughs> I can tell you right now, I have a lot of people yelling at me every day to get them more eggs because I don't have enough. Yes, follow up. Um, That's a good question. So let me just repeat it for folks listening yeah. to the recording. Sorry, Donnie. I know it no takes away from the spontaneity. <laughs> um, so the question is, is your approach to um, raising eggs uh, less invasive or sort of less likely to contribute to the development of an avian flu? Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a yes and no. Um, to be perfectly honest, keeping birds locked up in cages in a building is a really good way to make sure they don't catch pathogens. Um, but the difference we have is all of my houses are much, much smaller and spread out. So like if I had an outbreak, the amount of chickens I would lose would be, you know, in the tens of thousands at most. Whereas most of the outbreaks we've seen is, you know, you get one bird that has it in Iowa, it's usually 5 million chickens getting culled. Um, so since we farm in much smaller scale and way more spread out, um, the impact of an outbreak is vastly lower. Um, but we actually probably have slightly higher risk of getting an infection. Other okay. questions? Over here. Kind of follow up question, but uh, why is there a higher risk of chickens in your farm getting infections? Correct me if I'm wrong. So the question is why, why would there be a higher risk of chickens getting infections? The majority of avian flu outbreaks are spread by wild birds. So um, ducks and geese are actually, it, a lot of times they're carriers, so it doesn't kill them, um, but they can spread it to other birds. Good question. So this is a question about What's the financial impact of having to cull a large number of birds? Um, it really sucks. 
uh, USDA, I believe, pays you back for the disposal costs. Um, but they don't obviously pay for the replacement chicks or any of the, you know, the lost business and stuff. So, um, you know, it would be, um, it's in the millions of dollars for a large complex, tens of millions easily. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I have some pretty good friends out in Utah, um, another family farm that's lost a couple million chickens and, uh, I'm not sure they're going to make it this year because it's, yeah, it's pretty terrible. Did you still have your follow-up question over here? Oh, it's a separate question, but uh, so I see you mentioned that you work with the tribal people on the salmon farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you elaborate more on that? Yeah, it's not a, oh, sorry, do you want to repeat? Oh, uh, so the question was about um, working with the tribal people around uh, the salmon hatcheries? Yeah, we don't actually have hatcheries. We just, naturally, there's a lot of salmon spawning grounds be, um, from, you know, eddies and such in the, in the river. Uh, and so um, we just, we know that salmon have spawned there since time immemorable, and uh, we just want to make sure we're doing everything we can to take care of it. Uh, if you go there in the right time of year, you could just about walk across them in some of the little creeks and stuff. Uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, the only people who've been here as long as the salmon are the Native Americans, and, you know, we'll just, they're the experts, and we just work with them and say, you know, tell us what we need to do to take care of this. Other questions? Is it costly to have so many certifications? And I'll actually add on to that. If you could kind of walk us through what is your job like managing all the certifications, that would be great. Yeah, it's, it's pretty costly. Um, so the certifications themselves, you know, they generally cost thousands of dollars. Um, I think Certified Humane is like 10000 or $20,000 a year. Um, organic is a similar number. Um, it's, they're a lot of money. The other thing is they are, we undergo something like 30 audits per year um, for various reasons. Uh, and so that's a ton of time, a ton of paperwork. Um, you know, every time we do an audit, it's most of our senior management involved um, to do that. So yeah, we easily spend, you know, $100,000 a year or something on certifications and audits and the associated cost with that. Um, and it's it's a lot of work. Uh, you know, one of the reasons, one of the issues that a lot of small farms have with organic is the paperwork load is pretty intense. Um, so we have, you know, we've got full time, <laughs> we've got a full time person who just all he does is audits and certifications, and um, it's it's a lot of work. Um, but you know, I think it's it's always worth it because uh, we want to you know make sure we have someone backing up what we say. What's a day in the life on the farm? <laughs> yeah, um, well, like I said, I wear a couple hats, so I buy all the feed for our hens, so I spend a lot of time um, buying corn and stuff like that. Um, but then, you know, a lot, of it, a lot of the sustainability things is kind of a combination of working with our company and outside stakeholders. So, like, uh, I'm working on doing a greenhouse gas inventory for our company. Um, which we haven't done before. Uh, and so that's, you know, I got to work with all of our, like our accountants and our field managers and stuff to pull a lot of billing and usage rates and stuff. And then also the vendors who supply us to, to make sure it all lines up. Um, we're also involved in some advocacy. Uh, I actually had a call this morning with uh, Representative Schrei Schreier's office to talk about farm bill things. Um, so, you know, we're just, a big part of what we do is kind of trying to support and advocate for organic and sustainable agriculture in general. Um, and so that's, that's the fun part of my job. I like doing that. That's a great question. What happens between the chickens and the dogs and the eggs? And how do you protect the eggs? Yeah, a lot of uh, chicken hen husbandry when you're not in cages is around training. Um, so uh, whether it's cage free or free range or pasture, uh, <coughs> as soon as those hens move into a laying house, you have to start training them. Um, 
how to move up into the into the nest boxes and, and lay their eggs in the morning. Um, if you screw up the training, it can be a really big problem. Um, and so, for the most part, you don't get eggs like laid outside. Or people, you know, we don't have people who go around and pick eggs up off the ground all day. Um, that's actually kind of a food safety issue too. So we don't collect the ones that are laid out in the field. Um, you know, if there is one out, if if an egg's laid out in the field, a lot of times a dog or a chicken or something will. Uh, investigate. Um, so it, it happens. Um, you know, the, the eggs aren't bad for the field and not bad for the dogs or anything. So we don't worry about it too much, but we do kind of try and keep track of how many eggs are getting laid out there. And if it's, you know, if it's more than a few, then it's a problem that we have to deal with. That was a great question. So for the omega-3 testing, what happens to the eggs that don't uh, meet the threshold? Sure. Um, so with a lot of, like a lot of our eggs, if they don't meet like one level of certification, they can still go into like a, a different bucket. Um, so we're, we're pretty good about making sure, like we've got a program which is you feed them the flax product for this many weeks, and then when you test, they're going to make it like 99% of the time. Um, but where we have issues, um, like all of our omega eggs are also uh, free range or pasture raised, and I sell products that are like I have a product that's just brown free range eggs. So if I have an, an if I have a flock that I plan to sell as free range, brown free range omega, and they fail their test, then I can still package those into another product that it's not worth as much, and I've lost you know I lose money on the feed, but um, you know it's not like the eggs are going to go to waste. Good question. So you carry a lot of different designations, and it seems like there's a benefit for having these sort of different categories of product. Do you ever see yourselves moving in the direction of just sort of like the, you know, kind of highest level, like everything organic, everything, um, I guess, is pasture raised higher than free range? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, I would love to. Um, so it, it gets a little bit complicated. All, my farm, like all of my land, is certified organic. Um, the biggest difference in eggs is the feed. Um, so organic feed costs about triple what uh, conventional feed is. And, um, you know, any egg that I can sell is organic, I will. But, you know, I've got products where the, the organic, you know, the like mobile pasture, I have an organic version that you can get at PCC. It's their private label. Um, and then the Wilcox one. And the PCC one sells for like $9 a dozen right now. Um, and the Wilcox one, just because it's conventional feed, sells for like $6. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of companies that kind of draw that line in the sand of, you know, this is what we think farming should be. We're not, you know, we're only going to be the highest level. I kind of think of us as we're a little bit of a journey. Like, I will sell you the, the best egg that you can afford. Um, and I understand if it's not the best egg in the world. Um, we just, I want to sell more sustainable eggs. And I know that organic sometimes isn't what everyone can afford. But that being said, like I said, a lot of my advocacy is around how do I make organic more affordable. So um, like I said, when I was talking with um, Congresswoman Schreier's office today about was like how do, we, um, how do we support organic farming as a solution to climate, uh, climate smart agriculture it has a ton of public money right now. And how do, you use, how do you support organic as one of those solutions? And if we could figure out a way to put that into policy, it lowers the cost of being organic. So we, we, we try our best to get there. That's an interesting question. So the question is, um, in terms of your regenerative uh, agriculture approaches, are you collaborating with other farms and kind of sharing um, inputs and or um, do you have any plans or are you currently diversifying what you um, 
grow based on some of the regen regenerative organic principles? Yeah, yeah, we, uh, we put a lot of work into things like that. Uh, for example, um, all of the corn I buy comes out of eastern Washington, and all of those farmers want manure because it's a good organic fertilizer. Um, and so all of my corn comes in a truck, it jumps off corn, and I load it with manure, and it goes back and spreads it on the field. Um, so that's one way that we kind of divert all of our manure waste. Um, in pasture systems like mobile pasture, you know, a lot of that gets spread on the field on our own fields, um, and you know that's just a lot of work to manage. Make sure you don't put too much nitrogen or phosphorus on the ground, but you're you're still fertilizing. Um, we're I, I'm working with a startup company right now in Seattle trying to get um, like turning recycled food into chicken feed um, is another project that I'm working on. Um, you know, we're kind of we don't say no to anything. It just kind of has to make be operationally and make economic sense. Other questions from folks? We've got a couple minutes left. Yeah, hi. So um, I'm curious if certified humane has, has any effect on how like, the end of a chicken's life, say like its carcass or at the end of its life, how it will be, be treated? Thank you. That's a great question. So the question is what happens at the end of the chicken's life and to what extent does certified humane dictate practices around end of life and then what happens with the chicken's remains. Yeah, Certified Humane has uh, requirements around what are the acceptable methods of euthanization for hens. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, we just kind of go off their recommendations for the best way to, to euthanize hens. Um, they don't have rules around disposal. Um, you used to be able to turn, you know, spent hens into chicken nuggets or something. Um, most meat, there's not really meat processing plants anymore that'll take those. Um, so we compost ours, uh, which, you know, as, as things go, is a pretty good use for them. Um, it's a lot better than, you know, some places incinerate them, um, which would be significantly worse. Any other questions? Um, while you're maybe thinking, uh, we probably have time for one or two more. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more, since you're our, I think, one business we have represented, although we are having universities and organizations talk about their motivations for um, procurement practices with certified um, businesses. What motivates, maybe start with the history a little bit, like when did Wilcox start using certifications? And then what have been the motivations to kind of continue to um, use certifications and also expand the number that you have. Yeah, so um, uh, Wilcox Farms has kind of changed over the generations. Um, the In the 60s is kind of when the idea of putting hens into cages and stu such became uh, very popular and it was mostly um, for disease control and things like that. Um, and so uh, for quite a while, we had large barns and such with, with birds in cages. Um, and that was just the way everybody farmed. Um, and then uh, kind of about 25, 30 years ago, when the, the fourth generation started coming back to the farm, a lot of the research and kind of um, ideas around like how chickens should be raised had changed. And uh, my so my dad's generation and stuff kind of said, if you want us to to be farmers, we don't want to raise hens this way. Um, and so it, it took a very, very long time. It was like a 20 year transition and tens of millions of dollars to convert um, our operation over to cage free. And as we converted uh, out of kind of conventional agriculture, um, it, we just, the amount of kind of support and like overwhelming positive we got from our, uh, about switching to a more sustainable egg model, um, it really showed like we're on the right path and kind of motivated everybody to, to build our company around how do we just continue to figure out ways to farm better. Um, and as far as using certifications, you know, that all comes down to um, one, just being honest, you know, making sure that you're doing it the right way and having someone else tell you. The other one is liability. Um, you know, you're, you, we've been sued before for claims or something and, and it really sucks. Um, and so the easiest way to, to not get sued is you have somebody besides yourself making sure that you are, um, man, that you're meeting these claims. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. So we have time for maybe one other question. Anyone have anything out there you're curious about? Great question. How did Wilcox become the sole provider of eggs for the UW? Um, I mean, we've worked with UW for a really, really long time. Um, I think it's always been kind of Chef Tracy is one of the main ones that, that was a big supporter. Uh, you know, one of the great things about University of Washington is, uh, and universities in general, is they don't just care about what's the cheapest thing I can get. Um, mostly thanks to you guys, students are, are big like activists and saying we think the university should support uh, sustainable businesses and things like that. And so uh, we're a good match because the university and, and students want sustainable products and, and we make those. Uh, and so, you know, we do everything we can to take care of the university and, and make sure that they've got the right eggs and the university's nice enough to request us. Excellent. That was a great question and also a good sort of um, planting of the seed for when we pick up with uh, the UW Sustainability Group at the end of the course. It's our second to last um, guest speaker. We'll kind of hear the university's perspective on uh, procurement around certification standards, and we might even get the university perspective about that as well, specifically for eggs, but perhaps for other products as well. Um, okay, if there aren't any other questions, let's give Donnie another round of applause. Thank you for your time.